Psalm 56. I'm going to read this one from the New King James Version this morning. Psalm 56, verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. And I will not fear what can flesh do to me. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger cast down the peoples, O God. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praise to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Lord, we thank you for the word today, and we know that thy word is truth. You said in your word that we would know the truth. And in knowing the truth, we would find true freedom. Help us then today, Lord, to experience in the everyday shoe leather of our lives that freedom that comes from knowing the truth. Not a truth, not an interpretation of truth, but knowing the truth. And we have grown, Father, to see that knowing the truth means, first of all, knowing Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the truth. Thank you for the truth, for the freedom that it brings. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. This psalm is quite interesting to me. It begins, be merciful to me. Another way of, of stating that word, translated into English, merciful. Uh, when you hear the word in this context, the person reading in the original tongue of Scripture would get this picture. Uh, Bend in kindness and show me thy favor, O God. That's what it means. Bend in kindness and show me your favor, O God. What a picture. When crying out to God for mercy, we can see in our mind God bending in <coughs> kindness toward us and showing us favor. Now, we know that uh, grace is unmerited favor. So grace is God showing us favor that we don't deserve. I don't deserve anything from God. Now, I don't have a, a poor image of who I am in Christ. I want to hasten to add that I know that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm in right standing with God. That doesn't mean I don't sin and that I don't make mistakes as I do both quite well. But what it means is that I am always able to go to God in true repentance and find 
in Him forgiveness and restoration so that that favor brings me a renewal of that right standing whenever I fall it up. Because my right standing with God is not based on what I've done, how good I am. It's based on something that was done for me that I could not do for myself, something that I received as a gift and that I don't deserve. And like Paul, I feel like now I owe a debt. He paid a debt he didn't owe because I could not pay the debt I owed. So now I owe a debt, but it's not a, a debt to repay for my sin. It's a debt to proclaim this message, to let others know what God can do for them. That's how I am discharging the debt that was paid for me by helping others have their debt paid also and finding this joy and this freedom. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. And that word swallow means to inhale eagerly. What an interesting word. Man would just inhale me eagerly. And it also has to do with devouring in anger. I'll tell you what, it doesn't take long on a daily basis to get somebody around you mad. We live in a time when people are very short fused. Now, aside from our spiritual battles, which go on all the time, I think from verse uh, beginning in verse three here, we may get a better idea of where I believe the Holy Spirit is uh, going with us today. Notice he says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Whenever I am afraid. It's not a sin to be afraid. It's a sin to live in fear. And there's a difference. I've been afraid. You've been afraid. We are wired to experience that emotion in the face of things that we don't know or do not understand or cannot resolve immediately in our mind. The psalmist said, whenever that occurs, whenever I sense that fear, Whenever that agitation begins to present itself, because the Bible quite clearly says that fear is a, is a tormentor. Fear has torment. That's why God has not given us the spirit of fear. We have His power dwelling in us by the Holy Spirit. We have the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? It produces a sound mind. And we have this. And so when that fear presents itself, that's the time. And if you need to do it consciously for a while until it just becomes a matter of unconscious routine in your life, you turn at that moment and you just remind yourself as you speak to the Lord and do it out loud if you have to. Oh, God, I trust you. I don't know what's happening here, but I trust you. When life all of a sudden takes a radical change, as it does for some people, going along and we think everything is just the way we like it, and then something happens that absolutely puts us on a different path, alters our plans, changes what we believed it was going to be like. We can sense fear rising up. And so what do we do? We trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 are... Quite familiar to most of you, I am sure. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And there are four basic points made in those two verses. First of all, it's trust in the Lord with all of your heart. I have been guilty of half-hearted trust once in a while in my life. I'm sure we all have. We go through the motions, the machinations. I trust you, God. Oh, I trust you, God. But inside we know that we're looking for a contingency plan. Now, that's not always easy to spot in church circles because you say to somebody, how are you doing? I'm trusting God. I'm hanging on. I have faith. And very often for fear of making a bad confession, or for fear of, of being perceived as weak, we don't actually tell a person if we're hurting. 
or if we're facing a fear in our life at that moment, or if there's something for which we would like prayer. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That means we can't reserve a little place down inside just in case God doesn't come through. And that kind of abandon, by the way, is not easy. It's easy to to talk about it and intellectually absorb it, but it's very difficult to live it on a consistent basis because, again, as human beings, our tendency is, I'm going to work this out. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to uh, get a plan here. We're taught that way. And then in our spiritual life, we want to bring all of that over and begin to build the same model to get out of our dilemmas. And and God is saying, you know, put that stuff away. There's nothing wrong with having plans and there's nothing wrong with working your plans. But when it comes down to these things that you are powerless to control and powerless to do anything about and don't even really understand, even though you'd like to think you do, you've got to learn to trust. And the word trust, as most of you know, we've talked about it so many times, has to do with leaning on God in such a way that it is an absolute dependence upon Him. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Well, say, I've got that pretty much with a good handle. Pastor, I I am learning to lean. I'm learning to trust. I know it's a lifelong process. I know it's something we just don't arrive at one day and then we never have a problem with it again. But I am, I'm there. That's good. Number two, the next point in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is, and lean not to your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. In other words, when you're leaning in absolute trust on God, you need to learn to shut off that intellectual center that is trying to, with human understanding, come to terms with what's going on. Now, it's not that you can't understand. There are some things, there are hidden things, there are secret things that belong to the Lord. But then there are those things that are revealed and they belong to us. And there are very often circumstances which you find yourself in where you know that the only thing you can do is lean on the Lord, but it doesn't mean you cannot know what's going on. The difference here is is that if you let Him, God will help you to understand, and God will be the one to show you what is really happening. But that only happens when you shut off that endless cycle in your mind of trying to come to terms on your own with what is happening. I once heard someone say, there are some things that are just imponderable. I said, well, what do you do? I don't ponder them. And you know, the more you think about it, the more you realize, now God knows everything. Why do I expend so much energy trying to know something He already knows instead of seeking Him to simply show me what He knows? And even our prayers are often that way. Here we are praying, and what are we doing? We're not praying to God. We are not asking of God. We're telling God. can't tell you the number of prayers I've stood and listened to where people are simply telling God what they want, telling God how to do it. And maybe that's why one of the definitions someone used of prayer is the one who knows nothing at all telling the one who knows everything what to do. Now, we should keep on praying. I learned a long time ago, even when our prayers are a little bit misguided and not quite right on the mark, it's better to pray and not be 100% right in the way we pray than not pray at all. Leaning not to your own understanding. Look at the third point from those verses. It's in all of your ways, acknowledge Him. And in my notes I wrote, I must acknowledge my need for God's help. Now, why do I write things like that to myself? Because I'm a man and men have a predisposition to needing nobody's help. I don't need anybody's help. I can do this myself. How many times have I heard myself say that? You know. So when I go to the Lord in all of my ways acknowledging Him, what I'm really saying is, I need your help. I can't do it. And then the fourth point, it says, 
He will direct your path. He will direct your path. Now they build on one another. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You get rid of your contingency plans. You lean not to your own understanding. There are times when you will not be able to figure out what's going on, but He can show you and help you understand when you look to Him. You acknowledge that I need your help, God. I can't do it on my own and I don't want to. I know where that leads. And then He will direct your path. And you know the Bible tells us that His Word is the lamp and the light to our feet. It lights up the path before us. Now, going back to the psalm we are looking at here, notice in the fourth verse it says, In God, and I like in the New King James it says, In God, and then in parentheses it says, I will praise His word. In God, repeated, I put my trust, and I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Now, I jotted down four things from that verse, and I, and I titled these four points that I can find in that one little verse, what to do when fear strikes your heart. Number one, it says, I will praise God for His Word. You know, I'm so thankful for the Word of God. You know, where would we be in our lives if we did not have this reference point, the Word of God? Do you remember what it was like before you knew anything about the Bible and knew anything about God's Word? You might have had your religion and all, but, you know, you kind of, when difficulties and storms of life arose, you grabbed at anything and everything that you could. You drew on any knowledge that you had absorbed. You leaned on friends. You asked for advice, did whatever it was to try to resolve it. But there wasn't one clearinghouse of information that you relied upon for your answers. It's the Word that makes all the difference in the world. You know, the devil doesn't care if every human being on earth were in church on Sunday morning enjoying a religious experience as long as the Word isn't there. He blinds the hearts and minds, according to the Scripture, from hearing the truth, from finding the Word, not from acknowledging God. The Bible says the demons acknowledge God and tremble. doesn't save them. It's the Word. When fear strikes the heart, the first thing I become thankful for is that I have the Word of God. I have it in me and I know where I can find more of that revelation. The second thing, I again consciously put my trust in God. Now, you know why I say that? Because every situation we face, every time something comes up, we have the choice to trust God or something else. You pick up the newspaper and it says, the stock market plunged and the interest rates went up and the fuel prices have doubled and all these things, you have a choice. Do I trust the frailty of the economy and start to say, well, probably going to have a real rough year. I don't know if we're going to make it financially. Uh, to cut back on the car driving and, uh, and have to, might have to sell the house. And, and, or do I say, okay, well, the economy of the world looks pretty bad. Thank God I don't live by that economy. Thank God my provision comes from God. He is my source, and it doesn't matter to me if Wall Street collapses. It doesn't matter to me if the gas prices go through the roof. It just doesn't matter because one way or another, God will not forsake me. He'll meet every one of my needs according to His riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Now, where did I learn that? Time Magazine? The Roper Report? I learned it from God. I found it in His Word. Well, how do you know it's true? I have no reason to believe he lies, see. And those are choices, and I make them every time. I, I, I could choose to side with everybody else and, and run around in a frenzy of worry and fear, or I can just go on with life and say, God is in control. You say, oh, you're being unrealistic, you know. What if, what if your job gets cut back? What if, you, what if that gas is putting a pressure on your wall? Well, it, it is. And those things do happen. People lose jobs. 
And we do experience the discomfort of these changes very often. I'm not talking about living in such a way that we never, ever experience a difficulty again. I'm talking about knowing when we are experiencing those things that they're temporary and we're going to make it and God will turn the captivity and restore to us whatever has been stolen. Your attitude determines your altitude. Things go wrong. How's your attitude? Is your attitude, oh, here we go. Captain goes down with the ship. I'm going right down. Is that your attitude? Or is your attitude, you know, well, I'm going to make it because God is with me. If God's for me, who can be against me? This is temporary. Amen. Amen. I will put my trust in God. Now, I could put it in other things. The third thing when fear strikes is like the psalmist said, there's a decision to be made, and here's how he made it. I will not fear. I will not fear. So he's looking fear in the face and saying, no, sir, I will not give in to you. I will not give in to you. And the fourth thing, when fear strikes the heart, depending upon the circumstances, of course, but you'll notice in that fourth verse, it's, uh, it, it's, it says that uh, what can flesh do to me? Well, it, literally, it says man can do nothing to me that is of any great importance. It's asked in a rhetorical question, but what can man do to me? Well, nothing that's of any great importance. You say, oh, it messed me up. That can hurt me. Well, then think about what Jesus said. Don't be afraid of the ones that can kill your body because that's all they can do is put an end to your life. You be concerned about the one who can take your immortal soul, your spirit. That's right. All right, let's move quickly through the remainder of these verses. In the first, uh, fifth verse, he said, All uh, the day they twist my words, all their thoughts are against me. All day they twist my words, they, they trouble my affairs, they think about hurting me. Verse 6, they get together secretly, they watch my every move. Just remember that. There are people watching you in the world. And there are some waiting for an opportunity to lash out at you and strike at you. It's, it's not a great place sometimes, this world. The seventh verse, they, they cannot get away with their folly. So, Lord, and this is important, what the verse 7 is saying, Lord, you fight my battle for me. You fight my battle for me. Let the Lord fight the battles for you. Romans 12, 19 is a great reminder. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God's on our side. Verse 8, he said, Lord, you see what I'm going through? You can count all my tears and you keep record of my sorrows. In the ninth verse, when I call on the Lord, my enemies will flee. I know this for a fact because why? Because God is for me, Romans 8, 31. God is for me. Verse 10, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. Verse 11, in God I have, notice that, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. Choices again. You can trust anything you want. You can be afraid of anything you want. Or you can choose to put your trust in God and you can choose to cast that fear aside. Say, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. What could man possibly do to me? Verse 11 concludes. And then in verse 12, he said, I have made a vow. I have said it and I will do it. Number one, I will praise you. I will offer thanksgiving. When the pressure is really on and it just seems like nothing is going right, that's the time that you have to praise God and it's not easy to do. And that's the time that you have to start thanking God. It's not easy right now, but look at how blessed we are. Look at what we have been given. Look at what we have enjoyed. Look at how God has shown himself for us. I don't have any business whining in his presence now. I can tell him I'm hurting. I can shed the tears of the pain. But whining and complaining? Next, he said, for you have delivered me. So here's where faith speaks. This is where faith calls those things that are not as though they were. This is where faith sees beyond the immediate to the eventual and says, I know you have delivered me even before it's done. 
And while I'm not advocating foolishness or presumption, I'm saying that you need to be able to see the solution in life and not just the problem. And then in verse 13 says something else. You have kept my feet from stumbling. You have kept me so that I can walk in your presence in the light of eternal life. God will keep you until that day. Paul was pretty convinced of that. He said, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from his love and that God will keep me till that day. Another occasion, he said. God will keep all of us until that day. Lord, we thank you for the word today. We thank you that it is life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. Lord, we know there are some among us who even now struggle. We know these trials, Lord God, are difficult to endure. But I pray your power right now would come. And give us that reassurance on the inside that you told the truth when you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. You told the truth when you said that we could trust you with all of our heart. And that in all of our ways you would direct us. Lord, you see the difficulties and the circumstances this morning. And the pressures, the fears, the anxieties. Once again, we lay them at your feet. We thank you for your comfort in the struggle. We thank you that we can draw strength from you, Lord, because right now we're not feeling real strong. But we know that our strength comes from you, that strength which your boundless might provides a strength that enables us to do all things through Christ, for he strengthens all of us. And we thank you today, God, and we give you the glory today, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen.